Today, TCI is a leading two-year technical college that is celebrating its 100th anniversary. What's so exciting is the next 100 years can be just as good, if not better, than the first 100 years. We have the intelligence of faculty and the capabilities of our programs to look at what the new technologies are happening in this century, what the exploding new technologies are going to occur in this century, and to be at the forefront of that education. It's bustling with students. They are eager for a rich educational experience, which will prepare them for successful careers. The story of their college, TCI, is the story of the last 100 years in America. It was the early 20th century, the dawn of the modern era. Theodore Roosevelt was president, and the nation was excited about new technologies and how they might improve society. In 1906, two very different men met in New York City. One of them was Guglielmo Marconi. A few years earlier, on December 12, 1901, he had suddenly become one of the most famous scientists of the new 20th century. Marconi had accomplished what many thought impossible. He had transmitted a wireless electronic signal from England to Newfoundland, across the broad expanse of the Atlantic Ocean. It was the birth of radio communications. Born in 1874, Marconi was a young, wealthy Italian aristocrat and held the noble title of Marchese. His mother, Annie Jameson, granddaughter of the founder of Jameson Whiskey, was from Wexford, Ireland, where she was a member of a very wealthy Irish family. Because of his excellent command of English, Marconi was quite able to expand his operations from the United Kingdom to America, where he established the American Marconi Company and was a frequent visitor. It was there in 1906 that he met a 15-year-old office boy, David Sarnoff. Sarnoff's background could hardly have been more different than Marconi's. He was born into a poor Jewish family in Russia in 1891. Poverty and anti-Semitism made the Sarnoffs move to America in 1900. In New York City, young David had to work to help support the family, and his formal education was limited. In contrast to Marconi, he had no wealthy or influential relatives to help him make his way in the world. Fortunately, Marconi was very impressed by his office boy's exceptional intelligence and drive. The wealthy Italian scientist became David Sarnoff's mentor, patron, and lifelong friend. Marconi continued to further develop and commercialize his wireless telegraphy technology. In 1909, his achievements won the greatest possible world recognition when he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics for his path-breaking developments in wireless communications. To realize the potential of Marconi's innovations, an increasing number of technicians had to be trained. In 1909, a school was established in New York City for that specific purpose. It became known as the Marconi Institute. This was the beginning of what is now known as TCI, or Technical Career Institutes. It was a very small company in 1907, 1908, 1909. And beyond that, talking to, here is a man who's just won a, a Nobel Prize in 1909. He's commercialized and made uh, wireless communication uh, commercially possible. Um, what does Signor Marconi think is next? The school had a modest beginning with only a handful of students. Its first location was in a penthouse at 42 Broadway in downtown Manhattan. Demand for training was so great that the school had to move to larger quarters located at 29 Cliff Street where David Sarnoff became an instructor in 1912. That year also brought him his first national recognition as a result of his work in relaying messages regarding the sinking of the Titanic on its maiden voyage from England to the United States. 1,507 men and women were lost, but over 700 were saved due to the use of the Marconi wireless to coordinate their rescue. It was a dramatic example of the value of wireless telegraphy. David Sarnoff quickly moved up the ladder in the American Marconi Company and became a manager. He visualized the potential of a new technology even more than Marconi himself at the time. In 1916, he wrote what became famous as the Radio Music Box Memo. It predicted the vast possibilities of radio as a means of mass communications, including entertainment, news, and instruction. On April 6, 1917, the United States entered World War I. The Marconi Institute was taken under control by the United States Navy, 
and achieved a national importance as one of the main training schools for wireless communications for the military. By 1918, the school had graduated 3,000 students, and David Sarnoff was its managing director. After the victory achieved in World War I, the Navy, led by its young assistant secretary, Franklin D. Roosevelt, insisted that national security required that only American citizens should own wireless communications companies in America. Marconi himself had never become a U.S. citizen, and so he was not acceptable as a chief executive and owner of his American subsidiary. In 1919, to allay those concerns and satisfy the Navy, General Electric bought controlling shares of the American Marconi Company. Using this as the foundation, on December 1st, 1919, GE established the Radio Corporation of America, more commonly known as RCA. David Sarnoff, already a naturalized American citizen, became one of the main owners and in turn became vice president, president, and chairman of the board. He led RCA to full independence from General Electric. The Marconi Institute was also saved by becoming a part of the Radio Corporation of America. The school's name was changed to the Radio Institute of America, which lasted until 1929. In that year, the school became known as RCA Institutes, a critically important subsidiary of RCA. Marconi kept a connection with the school and for many years was its honorary chairman. RCA became one of the greatest electronics companies in the world. In 1926, Sarnoff, under the auspices of RCA, pioneered his concept of creating radio as a mass entertainment and communications medium by establishing NBC, the national broadcasting company. It was the first and for many years the most popular radio network. He also supported the application of new technologies in other areas of entertainment, such as development of sound films and higher quality records through RCA Victor. As each new technology was developed, courses covering the technology were added to RCA institutes. Sarnoff realized the importance developing quality entertainment to go along with technological developments. In 1928, he joined with Joseph P. Kennedy to co-found RKO Studios, which would make artful films like Citizen K. The RCA chief also pioneered in the creation of television. In April 1939, at the New York World's Fair, with President Roosevelt present, David Sarnoff announced the start of the first regular television service in America by NBC. The school played an important role in the parent company's activities and plans of David Sarnoff. As early as the 1920s, at least 90% of RCA's technical operators were trained at the school. RCA established a long-lasting practice of hiring the best and the brightest graduates. Sarnoff's educational philosophy was based first on developing academic excellence and then on providing a service to the community and to the country. He had come to America as a poor immigrant boy and achieved unimaginable wealth and power. He very much wanted to give others from poor or underprivileged backgrounds the chance to advance in life. For more than half a century, under Sarnoff, the school fulfilled these double purposes of academic rigor and educational opportunity while training many thousands for good jobs. Yes, it had an excellent reputation. What it was was a technical school for the electronic communications industry, and it was a training ground uh, essentially uh, fostered by RCA, uh, that is the Radio Corporation of America. I don't think they ever meant it to be a profit-making organization. The student body was uh, extremely high quality. We had many students that uh, ordinarily would have gone to a four-year college except for economic and personal reasons, uh, chose uh, the shorter curriculum of the institutes. You had um, the RCA institutes training people from Africa. You had the RCA institutes training people in Alaska for telecom in, in Alaska. Um, you had people from Eastern Europe uh, fleeing the Iron Curtain, and the Institutes opened its door to all of those people just as it opens its doors today. And I don't think there's any doubt that Sarnoff as an immigrant himself uh, would have felt any differently about it. In 1929, the stock market crashed and the Great Depression began. 
RCA, along with its subsidiaries, was remarkable in having a business model which enabled it to make substantial profits during many of those terrible years, one of the few major companies to do so. Its broadcasting arm, NBC, fully came into its own during the Depression, providing free news and entertainment to a downtrodden nation. It employed many RCA Institute's graduates to help serve its large national audience. Uh, so I suppose the children have been waiting to hear something about their funnies. Do you like them? Ah, uh, here's Dick Tracy. He is going to hire the best and the brightest at all levels, from the technicians, through the engineers, through the scientists, through the marketing people. And that's what's going to make this industry the best in the world, and this company the best in the world, is to have the best trained people at all levels. In 1936, the school became something of a think tank, with basic research being carried out on the premises and elsewhere by faculty members. That same year, it obtained its own publishing facility, the RCA Institute's Technical Press. It issued important scientific and technical books, as well as the RCA Review, a cutting-edge scientific quarterly eagerly read all over the United States and the world. David Sarnoff and Vladimir Zworkin, also called the father of television, were also contributors. On Sunday, December 7th, 1941, a state of war has existed between the United States and the Japanese Empire. Sarnoff, an Army Reserve colonel, concentrated on military communications problems. Eventually, he went on active duty in Europe for about a year, risking his life despite being over 50 years of age. He distinguished himself as General Eisenhower's communications advisor, earning a promotion to Brigadier General, and consequently, for the rest of his life, he wanted to be called General. The RCA Institutes continued to concentrate mostly on training students in communications and electronics technology for the national defense. And I turn over to you on behalf of the Radio Corporation of America, the most powerful radio transmitter ever built. In 1942, the Institutes had a Navy school with more than 800 enlisted personnel of the Navy and Marine Corps in the student body. Following World War II, the United States underwent a period of unparalleled growth and prosperity. RCA and the school were part of it. With David Sarnoff continuing as its chief, RCA made breakthroughs in many scientific and technological fields, such as the electron microscope, color television, computers, transistors, videotape, microprocessors, and an almost endless flow of technical marvels. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do RCA the RCA also participated in several lunar landing projects in the Apollo series and built much of the electronic equipment of the Viking Mars landing craft. Yet David Sarnoff never neglected the RCA institutes and continued to support and promote the school. On May 26, 1949, he addressed the graduating class of 163 at NBC Studios in Radio City, telling them, there is everything good yet to be accomplished in our lives and in our work. What man has done, man can do better. In the 1950s, RCA expanded into Mexico City and Montreal. By 1956, it had over 27,000 men and women enrolled in its classrooms and in its home study courses in the United States and in other countries. The year 1959 was the school's 50th anniversary. David Sarnoff arranged for a gala celebration at the prestigious Commodore Hotel. In 1960, a new branch of the school was founded in Los Angeles. In New York, the original school had more than doubled in size than the early 1950s. The RCA Institutes continued to expand by opening in 1961 a state-of-the-arts TV studio school. Having become too big for its longtime location on West 4th Street in Greenwich Village, RCA Institutes moved in January 1968 to 320 West 31st Street, which is the college's current location. The student body had reached a high point of 4,300. It was now a very diverse population. There were foreign students from about 75 countries. 
After graduation, many of them would go back to their homelands and apply the education received at the RCA institutes. Veterans of the armed services went on to successful careers based on their studies at RCA institutes. Two such achieving graduates were Louis Zanoni and James Haldeman. Both went on to work at RCA laboratories in Princeton, New Jersey after completing their studies. My hope for the future of this laboratory is that it will continue to uh, <clears throat> produce new knowledge and new developments and new inventions, particularly in the field in which it is expertise, the field of electronics and communications. They were attracted by the high quality education with hands-on training and the variety of study programs that were available. There was an intensive 27-month course providing rigorous scientific, mathematical, and technical instruction. A certificate was granted at graduation, and many of the greatest universities in America were ready to accept it as a basis for still higher education. Advanced standing credit was given by major institutions, including MIT, NYU, Columbia, Yale, and many other leading colleges. There were also shorter, though also intensive, training programs that more quickly led to good vocations. Zanoni recalled the rigorous requirements and high standards of his RCA Institute's education. This experience greatly helped him to achieve his later successes. Go to RCA Institute in New York City changed my life, changed my career, and um, it was the best choice I've ever made. He had an outstanding record of achievement at RCA Laboratories. There he was credited as a co-inventor of the LCD, Liquid Crystal Display, which has generated hundreds of millions for industry and still has numerous applications in computer screens, watches, and other devices. He also holds many patents. After leaving RCA Laboratories, Mr. Zanoni was engaged in business. In 1993, he established WZBN TV 25, a local television station in Mercer County, New Jersey. This was the first TV station in the area. James Haldeman credits RCA Institutes for the fine education he received there. It was a sound preparation for his later career. As I remember, the three, three guys I went to school with, every one of us had a job the day we graduated. Some of us worked at higher levels than others, but that really didn't seem to matter. Getting a job in the field was just fantastic. After graduating in 1963, he worked for many years at RCA Laboratories, where he participated in many of their revolutionary technological developments. In 2009, he was at prestigious Swarthmore College, working as technician and instructor in electronics. By the 1960s, RCA Institute's reputation for providing quality education reached a peak of national standing. Instructors who worked there at the time recalled the period. In 68, we still had some veterans from World War II. We were beginning to get some veterans uh, from the Vietnam War. Uh, these were older, more mature people, knew what they wanted, and uh, they were able to get what they wanted here. The standards, uh, as far as the school concerned, as far as the instructor is concerned, the standards were extremely high. Um, uh, everybody associated with the facility realized that our graduates were getting into industry. This reputation continued to attract some of the most brilliant young students from here and abroad. One of the most remarkable was Dr. Asad Madney, a 1968 graduate. Uh, I was born in uh, India and uh, I was looking around for programs uh, in electronics engineering which was at that point uh, the, the emerging field uh, that had tremendous amount of potential for the future. And during my search I found out that there were a lot of U.S. Uh, top-notch institutions that offered degrees in education in electrical engineering but there were very few that specialized in electronics technology per se. And among those, RCA Institute seemed to be uh, the world's leader, and that's what fundamentally prompted me to come here and seek an education in electronics engineering at RCA Institutes. He went on to more advanced studies, getting several higher degrees, including a PhD in engineering. He also became extremely successful in business, serving as the head of a Fortune 500 company. Dr. Madney has received numerous international honors for his work, including the 2005 Achievement Medal in London from Sir John Chisholm 
on behalf of the Society of Electrical Engineers. I think the fundamentals that I received at RC Institutes was basically the fulcrum and the building block on which I was able to not only uh, cope with higher education, but really to excel in the field of electrical engineering. But not everybody who went to the school went into scientific fields. Many in other endeavors credit the school for their success. These include Robert Smith, president of Duart Labs, the largest film developer and laboratory in New York City. So I took a course at the RCA Institute uh, to learn how to do cross modulations and learn different um, sound techniques and to improve the audio on the 16 millimeter sound prints. And that's how I came about attending uh, the RCA Institute. Other graduates of RCA Institutes are ready to testify to benefits derived from it. These include Bob Troller, leading sound engineer of Sound One, the main sound lab in New York City. RCA definitely gave me a good foundation in electronics to pursue that, uh, the career that I have now. Uh, we'd, we've done a lot of Martin Scorsese's films from Gangs of New York all the way back to uh, early Robert De Niro films. Sarnoff continued to give special attention to RCA Institutes during the 1960s, visiting it, speaking at events, and encouraging its continuing devotion to academic excellence and service to society. Although busy as ever, he would come unannounced to RCA Institutes and walk the halls to see how things were going at his beloved old school. It was uh, common for Mr. Sarnoff to come to the school on Friday afternoon and check on uh, students and instructors and were we still in school or, you know, were we out at the baseball game? And this one class we were in was a TV repair class. It had large windows. Uh, you were like in a fishbowl. It was for visitors to look in and see what was going on. And I would see him frequently. I didn't know who he was, so I asked one of my fellow students, and I said, uh, who is that, you know, who's that gentleman always watching us? And he said, gee, he says, in a New York accent, he says, I don't know. He says, I think it's Winston Churchill. <laughs> On December 12, 1971, David Sarnoff died, half a century of involvement with the school. With his death, RCA Institutes lost its great patron. It did not take long for his successors at RCA, who had no personal history with the school, to totally depart from his supportive policies. In August 1973, RCA announced that it was planning to close RCA Institutes. A teach-out was started. New students ceased to be enrolled. These actions by RCA caused vigorous protests. Stockholders opposed the move at company meetings. Pickets marched around NBC studios, and student veterans demonstrated in front of the school's new location on 31st Street. The following spring, RCA's plans to close the school seemed complete. Enrollment was down to about 500. However, the school supporters did not give up, and the protests continued. The teachers, led especially by Samuel Steinman, took the lead in organizing to save the school and obtained considerable media coverage. By that time, the school had graduated over 30,000 students. It was too important to New York to be allowed to die. When all seemed lost, the school was saved. Political leaders became involved. City Council President Paul O'Dwyer and Assemblyman Leonard Stavisky of Queens promised to try to get city and state funding for training disadvantaged students at RCA institutes. Congressman Herman Badillo heard about the planned closing and joined with fellow members of Congress, Bella Abzug, to obtain Veterans Administration's appropriations for the school. As a member of the Committee on Education, I had come to the conclusion that uh, an education beyond the high school diploma was going to be indispensable in the future. And the courses that the RCA Institute offered were important, and so I did everything I could, working together with Congresswoman Bella Absop, who was the congresswoman from the district at that time, to provide government assistance in terms of contracts and other assistance to ensure that the Institute would, would be able to survive. Bowing to public pressure in 1974, RCA agreed to turn over the school to a group of its faculty. The instructors agreed to raise $150,000, and RCA promised to give a $450,000 grant for expenses. The break with RCA turned out to be fortuitous because RCA itself disappeared in 1985 
when it was absorbed by General Electric, which ironically had played the major role in RCA's creation in the aftermath of World War I. The school was reconstituted as Technical Career Institute for TCI. Since the original group of owners numbered 30, it was said that TCI stood for 30 Crazy Instructors. Teacher Pianiano was one of the teacher owners. He recalled the transition. No one wanted this school closed because it was a fantastic school. They all knew it, and they wanted to keep it going. The school flourished and expanded again under the teachers. They may have seemed crazy, but they gave a new lease on life to an imperiled institution under Samuel Steinman as the first TCI president. I was on the staff of TCI at the time and serving as a veterans advisor. And my husband, Sam, who was the president of the school, realized how important it was to have an accredited degree, and he accomplished it. Steinman, a U.S. Navy veteran, said he wanted to preserve the school for the veterans since so many benefited from studies there. I was very proud to have run TCI, which was formerly RCA Institutes, and it was a great feeling to provide careers for students, and I loved it very much. The teachers did everything they could to ensure the continuing survival of the school. For almost a year, the new owners even worked without pay. Academic standards were kept high and enrollment grew. I graduated TCI in 1983, and with my father, Sam Steinman, serving as president, it was extremely difficult to graduate with honors. In 1989, the teachers sold the school to North American Training Services. Enrollment continued to grow over the years and especially took off with the dot-com boom of the late 1990s. When investments in Internet startup companies went into an inevitable decline, the school's enrollment dropped. The attacks of September 11th worsened the trend. In September 2005, North American Training Services, which had decided to leave the educational sector, sold TCI to EVCI, Career Colleges Holding Corporation, the current owner. Under EVCI's leadership, new majors have been added, enrollment has increased to once again over 4,000 students, and many features of the college, from finances to academic leadership, have been greatly strengthened. Coming to TCI is always the right thing to do because people get what they need for an education, for a job, um, just to get their life in order. My name is Sergeant Marquise Dawkins. I'm grateful of that computer skills that I was able to carry from TCI into our great army. Tech meeting with all the techs there, and you ask all the techs to raise their hands who went to TCI, it's pretty amazing. I currently own a company. The knowledge that I gathered from TCI really skyrocketed my career. And in four years after graduating, I had the opportunity to buy into a business. And so they all know Professor Judice, even guys who've been with Train for 20 years. We have a pretty good staff where they're really concerned with the students and they put the extra time, the extra effort to actually get these students to learn the material so they can get a good job. Today, TCI has a multitude of programs full of eager student participants. Teachers today give their full energy and devotion to training students to the highest degree possible to be able to use modern technology and maximize their economic opportunities so they can achieve the fulfillment of the promise of America. In accordance with the RCA tradition, many of the teachers at TCI are creative in a variety of fields of scholarship and culture. On May 19, 2009, a book fair at the school presented numerous publications by the faculty. Eager throngs of students attended. Academic standards continued to be highly important, not only in technology, but in the humanities, because the college seeks to provide a well-rounded education to all students. Student needs are met on many other levels besides the academic ones. There's a challenge here. This is not NYU, although that's a challenge in itself. This is not MIT, although that's a challenge. Here, a lot of students need some different kind of help that you don't find in other places that might be easier. David Sarnoff's tradition of service to society is a very prominent part of a TCI education. Teacher Robert Lubell is especially notable in this 
by leading students to develop a greater social conscience through numerous charitable projects such as the Dare to Dream and Dare to Repair programs. Um, when I first started in 1991 and some of the old timers were here, uh, they got me involved in a blood drive and fixing VCRs. Uh, they were from the military and uh, they just, um, their background was giving back to the community. That was always the philosophy of TCI. Just as for almost a century, the school demonstrates a special concern for veterans. I had a lot of fears about computers until I came here. Now I don't. We must be rededicated to seeing that they become successful students and then successful people in our society. Administrators deeply care for the welfare of the students and the school, seeking to meet the numerous challenges of our era. Our priority now is to provide a quality education, um, to have high academic standards, make them a part of the fabric of the work environment. One of the great strengths in this point of our historical tradition is that we bring together and try to balance theory. We teach things like physics, we teach a deep level understanding, but we also have hands-on and the students learn to take things apart, put them back together. Today's students feel that the school satisfies their needs and inspires them to fulfill their highest aspirations. The school is helping me with my leadership skills by allowing me to become vice president of student government and also starting a fraternity here at the school called New Gamma Frontline. History is definitely in the making and I'm glad that I'm a part of it and I hope that you could be a part of it too. I'm an accounting major, but I will become a lawyer and have my own law firm. Using the skills I learned at TCI, I can do my own finances within my firm. 2009, TCI celebrates its first 100 years. The school looks forward to the next 100 years and seeks to prepare the students for the technology of the future. As in the visit to the Honey Bee Robotics Company by a student group led by their instructor, Mr. Roy Lau. The students eagerly absorbed information about the futuristic possibilities of robotics. If we are able to have some growth, we definitely need to hire some to bring on some technicians for uh, integration, assembly, and testing of our, of our hardware systems. These contacts are also essential to assure entry to the jobs of tomorrow. Senior instructors like Alan Baxter are anxious to preserve the school's quality well into the next century. Sarnoff also believed in giving back to the community. Service was another strong characteristic of Sarnoff's philosophy. And that is something else that we must do here at TCI as we move forward. The school's administrators under energetic new leadership look forward to the second hundred years helping to fulfill the promise of America. TCI is one of the premier engineering colleges uh, in the country offering uh, associate degrees in technical education. I'm proud of the fact that I was asked to come here to participate as a member of the administration. When I was a young boy, my father said to me that the person that knows how will most likely have a job. But the person that knows why, the person that knows why will be their boss. Let our past accomplishments, of which we are justly proud, serve as an inspiration to all of us in the promising years ahead. My warmest thanks and best wishes to all of you. Good night.